Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to this press conference after the 137th uh, IFAB AGM here in London, live streamed on the IFAB.com. Uh, for the next half hour or so, the FIFA presidents uh, on the top table here with Mark Bullingham, Patrick Nelson, Noel Mooney and Ian Maxwell to answer your questions in relation to this morning's meeting. Uh, first, just going to hand over to this year's IFAB hosts for some opening remarks. Mark. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, we just wanted to cover off some of the topics that were talked about today and some of the decisions that were made. Um, firstly, there was a lot of talk about the trial to announce referees' decisions after a VAR decision, and that has started at the Club World Cup and then will be rolled out in further FIFA events this year, and that seemed like a good progressive move, so there was support for that. Talks about better application of uh, added time and the success of that in the Men's World Cup and how we could roll that out to other competitions. And I think that was a really positive step, particularly the application of actual time when a player goes down injured, because that removes the incentive for players to stay down longer than otherwise necessary. So I think, again, we saw that as a positive move and looked at how that could be rolled out more broadly. Talked about semi-autonomous offsides and, again, saw the success of that in cutting in half the time that's taken for an offside decision and how it is also more accurate and the potential over time to move to more of an autonomous system. Uh, again, progress. Talked about VAR Lite and whether there is a new model that could be even more accessible at a lower budget level to make it available both to competitions who don't have the resources, but also countries that don't have the resources for either <coughs> VAR Lite or VAR. And uh, a model will be explored around a video review system, which will allow um, matches with one camera to actually challenge a decision. There will be a protocol developed, and again, that will make technology more accessible to more countries. We did talk about concussion subs. Um, I think the starting point on that, say, is the most important part of concussion subs when you look at whatever model is the vast majority of players and that obviously in the grassroots game and for them the right model will always be permanent concussion substitutes because there is not the additional medic on site so in England for example we have over 100,000 grassroots teams for them that will always be the right model there is a difference of opinion on um, whether temporary concussion substitutes is the right model for the elite uh, but we had a, a discussion on that and decided to remain with permanent concussion substitutes and to continue to review that as we get more data in from the trial. But that is something that will be under constant review. And then the last one was um, we talked about player behavior uh, towards match officials, recognizing the trial that we brought in in England um, for body cams and we talked about what other measures we could do to better protect referees and have better um, behavior on the pitch. And we agreed to create a working group with IFAB, FIFA and other members um, to improve player behavior on the pitch. And that's something that will happen over next year. So that's a summary of the, the key decisions and actions, unless anyone's got anything to add. Okay. Can I add something? Of course. Yeah. Uh, well, just first of all, of course, also from my side, welcome to the beautiful city of London, to everyone here present for this IFA meeting. And just to inform you that uh, uh, maybe sometimes we are a bit slow but we get there. It took us only 137 years to have the first woman chairing an IFAB meeting. So I would like just to put on record my congratulations for Debbie uh, for her chairing this IFAB uh, uh, meeting. So also in this room, there are not too many men yet present, but we will get there hopefully in another 137 years. Uh, we'll have made a, a further step. We are getting there. We are getting there. It was it was a good meeting, very well chaired, and uh, uh, great collaboration by everyone. Thanks, Johnny. Um, so, if we could kindly ask you to keep the questions uh, to matters relating to today's uh, agenda. Meeting lasted nearly three hours. Uh, plenty to discuss. Who wants to go first, Martin? Johnny uh, Martin Ziegler from Times. On the, uh, the the item about the the additional time, I think a lot of a lot of fans supported FIFA's approach in the World Cup, and you say it was agreed this competitions around the world sh should follow this approach. But 
how, how can you how can you ensure that they do? Well, by by convincing them that it's the right uh, the right thing to do uh, by uh, speaking with them by showing them our uh, analysis uh, by clearly uh, seeing uh, uh, the benefits of uh, of this. We want to fight against uh, uh, time wasting. Uh, we want uh, the fans to enjoy the game. We have seen that. At uh, the last World Cup, on average, uh, we had uh, a bit more than 10 minutes uh, uh, additional time. I'm looking at Pierluigi to correct me, and around 60 minutes uh, of um, effective time being played, of course, with uh, variances in, in, in different games. Um, but it has been widely appreciated by, by everyone, and uh, uh, the laws of the game are there. The laws of the game are universal, and we have to ensure that also the application of the laws of the games are universally accepted. Now, we have seen from the analysis we made that already now there are uh, some, there is a very inconsistent application uh, of these laws of the game when it comes to additional time or time wasting in different parts of the world with some leagues who have uh, their matches lasting less than 50 minutes and others are at around 60 minutes already now. Um, uh, so we need first to, uh, to convince and then to uh, implement. How are we going to assure that? Well, uh, by counting as well on the, how should I say, the good and positive spirit of everyone involved in football who understands the universality of the rules. So I don't think there is any uh, coercive measure to be to be taken in this respect. Will you monitor, will you monitor leagues? Yeah. Yes, we will monitor leagues uh, all over the world, and uh, uh, we will search for the for the um, dialogue uh, with them. What is important is we are not changing the laws of the game. They don't need any amendments. They already foresee uh, these situations. We just have to apply them consistently all over the world. So there is no a stoppage uh, clock just to make this also very clear somebody said that i yeah. i have said or i was quoted i don't know that we don't stop the clock it's worth remembering <laughs> as well martin just to your point that you know when, when fifa changed the approach slightly for the qatar world cup everybody in scotland was talking about it everybody picks up on these things you know managers were asking is it going to be the same approach and and it's absolutely right that there's consistency across competitions you know we talked today about you know, subtle changes to other laws that impact on additional time. We now have five substitutes. They can happen in three different stoppages. Everybody's rule of thumb was always it's 30 seconds for a stoppage. You can now have three substitutes happening at the same time. So that's not 30 seconds, but it's not 90 seconds. It's somewhere in between. And mm -hmm. it's about ensuring that there's that level of consistency because, you know, additional time is important. League competitions, matches can be decided on, on goals. And we want to make sure that there's consistency across that competition wide yeah, martin if i could just perhaps add to that as well from uh you know what uh Gianni and ian have said very compelling presentation from pierre luigi this morning on on the data that came from uh from the world cup really really interesting stuff and i think it's a communication task from here on in um we've talked about it today and we we cascade the information from here and beyond to say that what we're looking for is consistency within the existing laws of the game in that we're looking for referees all around the world to add time on appropriately for injuries, add time on for substitutions. And uh, and, and Pierluigi picked this out, you know, goal celebrations. I mean, no, nobody wants to curtail goal celebrations. They are the essence of the joy of football. But equally, if you're the team who's just conceded the goal, you want to make sure that time is added back on. And so I thought it, it was really compelling from Pierluigi today. And I think it's a good story going forward that fits within the existing laws of the game. Simon. Mark said there's um, disagreement over temporary and permanent concussion substitutes. We know the Premier League, amongst others, would like to trial temporary. Why can't you run two trials? Because a lot of people say temporary is the way forward, that until you take players off the pitch... There will always be pressure from either the crowd or managers 
to keep players on the pitch. Yeah, I I, uh, uh, I don't know if there is disagreement, there is discussion, um, and that's how it should be. And then there are decisions which are taken, and that's how it should be as well. And we have decided to put the health of the players at the top uh, in this in this respect. Um, we started uh, a trial with uh, uh, permanent substitutions. Uh, we are still waiting, of course, to receive more data, more information. From what we receive, the vast, vast majority of uh, medical experts of the clubs, of the teams, are in favor of permanent substitutions because whilst, of course, we understand the pressure of the fans and so on, and, and um, uh, the teams and the coaches, uh, and the referees, everyone has pressure. Uh, but in all this pressure, our number one priority must be the health of the players. And when I hear uh, some experts, and again, we are still about to, uh, in the process of analyzing the data, saying that, uh, uh, I don't remember, 25% uh, were, not in football, were false negatives, meaning that sports, I mean, athletes go back to play in other sports, and it turns out one hour later, one day later, that they had a concussion, 25%. It's, for me, a high number. So we want to go ahead with this test. We think we are convinced, based on medical expertise, not on feeling by, I don't know what argument, uh, that this is the best way to protect the health of the player, to also take away the pressure. Um, we want to continue these tests uh, uh, and then we will see what the conclusion will be of these tests. If we t do another test with temporary, if, if we do something else, but for now we want to set the, uh, the first, the top priority at the health of the players and that's why we believe that if there is a risk or a feeling or a possibility that there has been uh, um, following a concussion that there has been uh, or there can be a problem, then it's better to take the player out, to take zero risk, and you have the possibility to bring another player in. Why couldn't you do two trials? Because we decided to do this one trial in order to protect the health of the player. <clears throat> uh, follow, following up on that on concussion. And based, sorry, and based on medical expertise, it's not my opinion or anyone else. <clears throat> Are you, I mean, obviously, concussion is an area that could potentially get litigious. There are, there's obviously a case in, in the UK at the moment. Are you worried that the leagues may look to challenge this in, in the courts, ultimately, if, if they're not given the opportunity to have this trial? To, and, and to are challenge you, what exactly? The, the, the protocol, because on the basis that it, it may not protect players sufficiently. And, is, and um, <clears throat> the existing protocol itself, I mean, there have been examples where I think even maybe FIFA would agree it hasn't been implemented very well. Um, are there things that you can do to the existing protocol to strengthen it? And what are those things? Well, we can always do things to strengthen protocol based on experience. I mean, one of the areas we are working on is to also proactively now uh, approach uh, those uh, club doctors of those leagues who are uh, carrying out the trial to have more dialogue, more proactive um, uh, exchange. Whatever else we can do, well, we have the experts here, uh, Andy, our, our medical chief, and the others. Uh, this is a medical issue. And uh, um, I repeat, again, based on, based on their expertise, but I cannot see anything more that we can do for the health of a player. I mean, the health of a player goes beyond the, uh, I don't know, the sporting side of maybe putting somebody back in to, because he's a good player or whatever. We cannot, we don't want to take any risk. We want to protect the health of the player. So we give an additional substitution. And if there is a feeling, it's up to the, it's a, it's a responsibility of those involved to take the player out and put in a new player. And only like that, we can really, really, really protect the player. So. Um, I don't see any, uh, and again, it's a trial. Uh, if we see that uh, there are better opportunities or better solutions, well, we'll go into that direction. So I don't see any way of, uh, I don't know, 
uh, challenging that. Uh, okay. I don't see that. Can I repeat one point as well? I think <clears throat> sometimes pe people put one against the other, but actually for the vast majority of football players, the permanent model is the right one and no one will dispute that because unless you have a level of resource where you have a medic there. So when you look at that, I think it's only... And it, it's only about 11 countries that are applying the permanent model at the moment or, or any concussion trial. So actually our priority is communication so that players understand the risk, so that coaches understand the risk and that more countries apply the permanent model. And that actually is the biggest priority for mm. all of us now. Mm. I think just to, just to finish right. off on that, um, the protocol is robust. It's, it's not anything that doesn't happen properly. It's not a, pro a protocol problem. It's an implementation problem. You know, it's... It's obviously personal to, to us all. It's probably more personal to myself. I'm, I'm part of the data set that was involved in the field study in Scotland. So I'm reading a report that talks about, you know, how potentially that's going to impact me having played professional football for as long as I did. So it, it is very personal. It's one that we want to get right. But there can be no dispute that if there is any doubt at all, a player has to come off the pitch. That has got to be the fundamental um, process here. And, you know, what is the risk? The risk is there's a decision made a, play, a temporary substitute happens. There's, a, there's an unfortunate incident further in the game, and that could lead to a, a fatal, I mean, a catastrophic event happening. And, and that's not something that that we can look to countenance at this point. Um, and that's why we're continuing with the permanent trial. Yeah. And it, it's an important, sorry, it's an important point what what was uh, raised here by, by Mark and, and by Ian. I mean, the awareness here in the UK, uh, you are. I mean, this is an issue which is high on the agenda people are very aware of it in the rest of the world this is not the case so we need to raise the awareness as well on this topic around the world uh, to make sure that our first priority is to protect the health of the player and first this has to go as well into the heads of everyone around the world rob hi there hi. <coughs> um johnny obviously one of the big rules of the game issue laws of the game issue in the last year was equipment and we saw with the one love armbands was that issue discussed at this ifab meeting we've seen some england players start to wear them again are you any more open to one love armbands at this women's world cup have you discussed those laws of the games uh we did not discuss them today um specifically because we have the laws of the game as they are and uh, we have the competition regulations as they are as well uh, as they've been and had been approved in the past before uh, the competition. What I can say on this particular issue is that uh, I think we all uh, went through a learning process there as well. And what we will try to do better this time uh, is uh, to search uh, and look for a dialogue with everyone involved, uh, the captains, the federations, uh, the players generally, FIFA, uh, from all over the world to capture the different sensitivities, to explain, to exchange and to see what uh, uh, can be done in order to express uh, a, a position, a value, or or or, what, or a feeling that somebody has uh, without hurting anyone else um, in a positive way. So we are looking for a dialogue, and we will have a solution in place well before uh, the World Cup, the Women's World Cup. Uh, I hope so, definitely. I just follow up another. So sort of rules the game issue, but one of the big issues as well came up to the Women's World Cup. You're still reviewing your trans eligibility rules. Is there any update on that in terms of male to female participation and where you end up as having seen what other sports have been doing? There is no update uh, yet, but uh, also there, I mean, we want to uh, be as clear as possible as soon as possible, not to leave it until the end, uh, even though uh, sometimes we think that uh, such as in the Armand issue or at the Men's World Cup, we think that uh, uh, our rules are clear and the situations are clear, but then we find out, well, actually, it's not, it's not really the case. So on all these topics, we need to learn our lesson and, uh, and be a bit, a bit faster. Thanks, Rob. Consultation will continue. There'll be a briefing after this with a couple of FIFA officials. I'll fill you in on that. OK, thank you. Uh, Tarek. Uh, Jenny, hi. Um, 137 years. Interesting you mentioned the comment about Devi. It's, it's too long, right? 137 years for a woman to chair one of these meetings. And you're quite right to point out this room as well. Um, just in light of that gender and trying to keep 
Hi. <laughs> What's your name? Jane. Jane. Welcome, Jane. <laughs> I'm trying to keep in with, with that introduction that you made to, to, to the press conference today. I noticed on Monday you released a statement like, heavily in support of Noah Legret, the French football president. He's had to resign because of this investigation and uh, inappropriate text messages to women. Um, and is he still retaining your support and keep that role at FIFA, given what we've just talked about, you know, gender equality and better stewardship of the game? Yeah, what this has to do with the, with the IFAP? Sorry. It's just your introduction was about it's great to have women. Yeah, chairing the IFAP uh, meeting. Do you want to I, comment? I well, well, we're here now. You might, you, you know, okay, it's up to you if you <laughs> want to answer the question or not. It's totally fine. Martin. Hello, gents. Um, I, I was told that there was likely to be uh, an amendment to Law 14 with regard to distracting the taker at uh, a penalty and penalty shootouts. Was that discussed, confirmed, or, or, or otherwise? Can you just give us a, an update yeah. on that? Sorry, Martin, my mistake. I should have included that in the summary. Yes, that was discussed and, and agreed and changed. That's so, it. That's yeah. it. Um, just one quick one. We're not about going back to the concussion issue thing that I've often thought, and I may be entirely wrong, and Ian will know this probably more than, than I, I always feel that club doctors are fundamentally compromised because whether or not you, they want to be, they have pressure from the coach to play. Is there, and it was interesting in, in the World Cup, that it was FIFA who basically stopped Iran playing their goalkeeper against Wales, having been concussed. Does the president, do others feel that at some point, maybe... In, independent doctors, particularly at the elite level, should be a consideration. That's a good. Uh, that's a good suggestion. Uh, certainly, one that should be. Do you have a good answer? Well, it is something that we've discussed with our medics. So, and and I'd refer to Andy as well. The challenge we have with independent doctors that we've been told is that actually when a doctor knows a player very well, it's easier for them to assess them. And a doctor that doesn't know a player very well might not pick up something. So I don't know if, Andy, you confirm that would be your point of view. Edwards found more about the concussion side of things. There are independent people questioning whether it's hamstring injury or concussion The fact that they're getting paid by a club and they're not getting paid by the 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 GMC. Ownership of clubs, including that of, of nation states owning clubs. From a FIFA perspective, do you think that's perfectly fine or do you think that needs to be to be looked at? in the round and I'm, you may not want to answer but I'll, but I'll have the opportunity to ask it here so do you think from your perspective should Qatar Saudi any nation state be allowed to to own a club well as I said before I did to to Tarek's question if we are speaking about IFAB this is now out of respect for IFAB no, yeah we should we should keep it to, to IFAB I we can answer this question okay. okay one other question last question on IFAB Tom <laughs> Thanks. Well, I was, I was, the only thing I was going to pick up, which might, might extend beyond IFAB, is I know Mark <laughs> Bullingham is, uh, has actually done a, 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 at the FA, they've done a lot of work around grassroots referees and improving behaviours, conducts around, around uh, on the sidelines, silent weekends. Is that something globally at all that, that do you think there's an issue around the world in terms of the way referees get treated? Very much so. It is, it is an issue. Uh, at the grassroots level, uh, at adult level, even at youth level, sadly. Um, uh, also in women's football. Um, I mean, it's 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 unfortunate. And uh, uh, we need to do whatever we can to protect the referees. And that's why we welcome very much when we discussed this the first time, uh, the initiative of, uh, of the FA, to see whether this can be a deterrent. There are other issues then coming up on this. I mean, uh, uh, image rights and and so on and so forth, uh, uh, privacy and, and stuff you film uh, uh, 
uh, if you record somebody. So whatever you do, there are, I don't know, side effects, but also there it has to be a priority of uh, definitely of, of, of FIFA, of IFAB, of all associations in the world to protect the referees. And, you know, whatever good idea uh, anyone has, please, you know, bring it forward and uh, we'll, we'll take it on board because it's a problem. It's an issue all over the world, all over the world. And we are losing a lot of young uh, referees uh, who... Just, I mean, why would you go to referee a game if you end up being insulted or even hit? And that, that way, it's an educational Wales, issue. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. And whilst we're talking about it at the moment in a grassroots context, this is a football problem from the highest level down because young players, parents that are watching games see the behaviour of players in high-profile matches, see the behaviour of managers, and they think that that's acceptable and that then translates itself down throughout the game. So... This is something that we need to tackle from from the very top to try and improve that because when you speak to other nations, refereeing um, the behaviour towards referees is a problem across the globe. Recruitment and retention is becoming more and more challenging because of those issues because people don't want to put themselves in that position for perfectly understandable reasons. You know, nobody would want to be, um, and it, but it's a it's a top down problem that football needs to tackle. And that's why we've agreed this working group. That was the final point that I'd mentioned right. about getting IFAB, FIFA and other members to come together to look at the behaviour, look at players and to address a number of issues, whether that's sideline behaviour, whether that's surrounding referees, a number of issues we want to take on from the top to the bottom of the game. OK, thanks, everyone. Conscious of time and schedule, Rob. Sorry, that's us. Are you quite pleased that FIFA do seem open to one of the armbands that the players would be encouraged by, perhaps? I think, as, as Gianni said, that we've started a, a conversation. I think nobody um, nobody enjoyed the circumstance that we had at the Men's World Cup. That was difficult for all of us. We've started a conversation to make sure that we can resolve the situation a long time before the World Cup, and we will absolutely be involving you know, a broad range of people in that conversation. But the intention is to, to agree something. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everyone. Uh, that's it for the top table. There will be a couple of separate briefings afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.